a really long time ago, this is this is no word of a lie. I was like, we need to be like UKIP. You know, we and people are like, oh, we don't want to be like that. And I said, he had a single issue. He took he took this country out of the European Union, like from nowhere. You know, one minute it was like laughing and mocking this man and how ridiculous it was, and the next minute we we voted to leave. we voted to leave. Why would we not want to be like him? Hello, and welcome to Maiden Mother Matriarch with me, Louise Perry. My guest today is Kelly J. Keane, aka Posey Parker the iconic and divisive women's rights campaigner. We spoke about the recent violent protests against her in New Zealand, about the new political party that she's founding, and about how she feels at being compared with Nigel Farage. As always, you can also find Men Mother Matriarch on Substack at louiseperry.substack.com, where you can also find extended episodes, bonus episodes, and the MMM chat community. Enjoy. Kelly, I wanted to start by talking about this um, cartoon that was, I think it was in the New Zealand Herald when you were um, out there recently, which I thought was the most amazingly telling cartoon. It, for people who haven't seen it, it was, uh, it's a picture of you, um, f- fairly depicted in a fairly sort of grotesque and, and unkind manner, right? Um, and about this high. And then this enormous, very obviously male hand is coming down with a with a with a fancy manicure, pointing at you. And the, the caption is something like, "New Zealand says no to turfs," or "New Zealand says turfs go home," or something along those lines. And um, you look at it initially, and you you assume that it must be written by someone who's sympathetic to you, just because the the big male hand is just so sort of unmissable in its sim- symbolism. But it's in fact it was in fact um, drawn by someone who. Um, is very uh, critical of you. And I just thought, I, I wondered what you thought seeing that cartoon for the first time. Well, I also thought it was a pro uh, Kelly J cartoon. I mean, I, I'm a rather chubby, older, white-haired version of myself. I mean, I don't think I'm that chubby. Um, so it was definitely mean, uh, but yeah, the hand, I just, I didn't even notice a manicure. It just looked like a big man's hand coming down from the heavens to tell tiny women <laughs> what to do. And I just, how can, I don't, just don't understand how the cartoonist didn't realise uh, what he'd actually drawn and that what message that was uh, going to, you know, what message people would receive because it was such an own goal. Yeah, as indeed I would say was the response to, that you got in Australia and New Zealand in particular, because um, for those who don't know, you, you are petite, right? You are like five foot nothing. And so the, the video, I thought, mm-hmm. of you being surrounded by these angry crowds of male people, uh, to, uh, like how can anyone look at that and not see what's actually going on in terms of the biological differences here? Yeah, it's so like weird. Um so because I ha- do have peroxide blonde hair um, and because I am five foot one and then also in that video I look, it's really weird, like fear seems to take about 20 years off your face. Maybe it's because you're so relaxed, your whole face just relaxes. So I look like this very small, w- frightened woman um, and with this blonde hair and then I turn and then I'm sort of, I look like Carrie on the other side. I'm just covered in this tomato soup. And so it's just, it's just perfect. I mean, I, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't have paid enough for that sort of um, perfect argument. And uh, you say, you actually say male people, I would say men. Um, And those men predominantly were men who think they're men. Uh, And then alongside that were men who call themselves women or trans women and uh, young women. you know, and there was a few sort of desperate older women who I can only assume have have um, sort of gone through the mutilation of their own kids. So it was a really interesting mix, but it was a very male energy, uh, despite the fact that there were numerous women in that crowd. Um, 
Can you talk a bit about this tour that you recently did to Australia and New Zealand, um, following on from your um, America tour last year, from which you produced a documentary? You 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 did the same thing, going to Australia and New Zealand, uh, bringing uh, lots of um, allies with you and hosting these events where you allow women to speak. Can you can you describe the reception that you received when you arrived there? Well, prior to landing upon either of those shores, there had been news stories about me. Um, and then, so what we do, so let women speak. The fundamental premise is that we create space in which women can speak. Like any woman, no order, no agenda, um, no hierarchy, just you put your hand up. And if I, you, if I uh, catch your eye, then you can step forward. And, and the idea is that we don't even have a queuing system. I'm really reluctant to do anything remotely formal or organized because I think it changes the whole feel of everything and then you'll get people jostling for a place in a queue so I just don't want any of that so it's really it really is quite perfect and it can only be this perfect because it's very organic in its uh system if you like so anyway so we did we started in Hyde Park or rather I started in Hyde Park and then um I did these in America and we, I could only do it because I've got this amazing woman called Iris who I say manages, I mean, you know, tyrannically rules over the stewards and marshals that help. She's ap- she's so wonderful. She's uh, just uh, perfect at doing her job. And another lady called Jo, uh, who helps with locals, and then another woman called Selene, who does all of my content. So without these things, I could do uh, none of the, the rest of it. So we did America, then I decided to go to Australia, and it's the same thing. We have local women, small teams of local women that do things like – get the permits, work out what the local, uh, the best place to have it, um, and then just organize it. They find marshals, like we do most of the work here, but they, they're they the people on the ground that do all the necessary stuff that we couldn't do from here. And then we just have these events, and they started off so wonderfully in Sydney, and the police kept the trans activists really far away, and obviously trans activists, what they want to do is just shut women up. I mean, they don't want us to speak, um, which isn't entirely a million miles away from any fascistic authoritarian tendencies. Um, and yeah, it was it was great. So we did Sydney, then we did um, Brisbane. That was also well policed. Adelaide, not so good. They were a bit close. Perth, um, good policing. And then we went to Melbourne, which was... Uh, very um it hit the news shall we say for another rally that was happening at the same time not people attending my rally there was another rally happening at the same time and those men gave nazi salutes whether or not they are they genuinely have beliefs in a pathetic um doomed to fail uh horrible uh ideology i have no idea but they did a nazi salute Were you able to actually see them when they were doing the Nazi salute when you were out on the street? Yeah, because they were opposite. So the 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 police like (laughs) the police marched these men peacefully, happily, jolly, um, in front of us. So up until that point, they were adjacent to us, so we we couldn't see them. We didn't know what they were doing. And in between us and them was another group uh, that was a freedom protest, which I can only imagine is sort of. Um, talking about lockdowns, talking about people losing their jobs to automatons, um, and that sort of thing. That's what I assume by freedom. I have no idea what their values are at all. Um, so we, you know, we weren't bothered by these people. That's not what we come for. We're not bothered particularly by the trans activists. Uh, there were two different sets of trans activists as well. Um, you know, the the idea is that they give us a perfect backdrop to women peacefully assembling to speak. And what they do is they show why the bloody hell we have to do it, which is because um, these people cannot accept women's boundaries. So it's in your interest, actually, when trans activists show up and are loud and aggressive and trying to to stop women speaking. It's, it's, It's actually... Well, I win either way. Yeah. Sorry. I win either way, right? If they don't turn up, then we get to hear women's voices without fear and intimidation. And it's just wonderful. And these women break the silence in their lives, which is, for some of them, is an extraordinarily liberating thing to do because they've been holding this in for years. 
and they just want to say, they just want to say that they don't like it, that they feel gaslit, that they're afraid. Um, and so it's amazing. If the trans activists stay away, we get to do it peacefully. And if they show up, we get to show everybody just who they are. So it's um, it's very difficult not to count either way as a win. But the apparently Nazi guys showing up was not a win, I would imagine, given the media response afterwards. Well, it depends, doesn't it? Because if, if my entire um, reason d'etre is to... Uh, I don't even know if that's the right word. I sometimes feel like I'm uh, the guy from Only Fools and Horses um, with my spoonerisms. Um, so if uh, if my whole job is to tell everybody to listen and look, and even if they listen and look at first because it's a terrible news story and, and I'm associated with this, then there may be, say, 25% of people who already loathe me or already think these things are maybe solidly on the left that think Nazism is the biggest threat to mankind right now, and I would argue it is not, then they might be persuaded. But then there'll be loads of other people that have been accused of being Nazis anyway, so they'll just dismiss that and think it's ridiculous. There were some people who are really sceptical about what who benefits from those men turning up and being photographed in the media, and they will look beyond. And then there's uh, quite a few people in the mid middle who know nothing about it, who will then go, well, what is Let Women Speak? Who is that woman? Is she a Nazi? Um, let me read a little more about it. And in countries like New Zealand and Australia, they have been, their media is so terrible. And throughout both really hard lockdowns, their media turned against them. So I think they probably have a healthy distrust of media anyway. But that incident in Melbourne, I would imagine was part of the reason maybe that, that um, tensions were so high in New Zealand when you arrived? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, I was, I arrived uh, the day <laughs> as I was flying from Australia to New Zealand. And I knew that for the past, even before I left these shores, so a good four weeks before the media started talking about how I shouldn't be allowed in the country and the different um, legal processes uh, that were happening to try and stop me getting in the country. Was I really allowed a visa? What visa did I have? Um, you know, that was all happening. And then as I was flying over, there was a an urgent court case to try and stop me from being allowed to enter. Um, my hotel cancelled, so I had nowhere to stay. Um, I was kept in immigration for two hours. Um uh, searching through every single piece of my luggage, but not me. So I can't, I don't know what, whatever it was that they thought they were doing, um, whether they'd been told to do that to delay the media that was waiting for me as soon as I crossed through. And it, it was like turning up to a country as a, as a famous person. It was totally mad. I mean, the, the response in, the response in Australia and New Zealand, I think really showed actually that, that you're sort of, um, iconic status that you've achieved. I mean, in, in t uh, divisive, clearly. I mean, the, the, it, I, I found it just astonishing look, looking at the interviews with um, people who'd showed up at the rally in New Zealand and they were just so vitriolic, like amazing. But you also inspire mm. passionate, passionate adoration in your fans. So it goes both ways. Yeah, well, I think you have to take both things with uh, in equal measure. You know, people that are, Sometimes I read things about me that are very, very nice, but not <laughs> not very true. Um, and I do think that, that people who sort of do fan-level stuff, you just have to make one mistake, and then they easily switch to people that loathe you. So I think you have to be really careful. Plus, I've got teenagers. I don't have any time to have an inflated um, sense of who I may or may not be. Um, but, yeah, I think if you if you take – the compliment and the criticism in equal value or no value at all, then I think you can, you can stay a bit grounded. Hmm. Um, how, so anyone who hasn't seen the footage of what, of what happened in New Zealand, um, I'd encourage you to go and have a look. It's very revealing, I think, of, of sort of where we've got to in terms of this debate. Um, I think you've said that you really did feel as though you might be about to die at 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 one point during that during that um 
I was going to say protest. I mean, it was it was basically a riot. Yeah, it was. Uh, there was one point, so we came off the bandstand, which they call a rotunda, and I came off, and um, I've only taken quite a few steps off the like away from the steps, and the crowd just surged forward, and I looked to my uh, right, and there's Tanya an incredible woman from New Zealand who'd also get, got the soup thrown on her. Um, and there was a, another couple of men and I was at a 45 degree angle to the floor as opposed to 90. And I just thought, oh God, if I don't get up, if I hit the floor, I, I won't get up. And then there was the, or I'm going to get crushed. You know, They're going to keep pushing and, and in between me and <laughs> me and death, there are about two other people on a wall. And if they, you know, and that's not, that's not necessarily that these people wanted to kill me, although it did very much feel like that. Um, but even in a normal kind of non-aggressive mob, uh, in just a crowd, like these things get out of hand really, really quickly. Yeah. And were the police, were the police any assistance? Not until we'd got right the way through the mob and then the police looked a bit shocked. But something's going on. I mean, for them, when I'd, I sort of marched through the mob to get to, or the crowd they were then, to get to the middle where I was going to speak uh, and I got a few kicks on my way in. But I thought the police were going to be there in the middle. Like I never would have gone to the middle of such a hostile crowd if I didn't think the police had some sort of safe uh, boundary, um, including some police bodies. Um, so when I got in there, I was like, oh, where are the police? Uh, and then we left it eventually because they, they started tearing down the fences um, and they were, it was like some sort of zombie apocalypse and they were just coming in, more and more people just coming into where I was. And then the security guys just said, the police aren't coming which in the movie of my life, <laughs> if there was ever a movie of my life where there's sort of a, a kind of a scene that changes everything, uh, it's going to be that line, you know, the, the police aren't coming, just nuts. How do you find police normally respond to these events? Because I think this isn't the first time that there's been um, argy-bargy, to put it mildly, at one of your events. Mm. Um, sometimes the police are good so uh, Newcastle for example those police were brilliant uh, Bristol were a little bit uh, they just didn't take enough precaution or take it seriously I think a lot of police actually bef when we first started doing them have no idea just how these trans activists feel that they can behave um, so the people that come and oppose us not all of them really even care about trans. They just hate women. Um, so I think the police now have no excuse uh, but to recognise and accept that these these people are aggressive and menacing and violent and uh, aren't particularly bothered about what is legally um, okay to do. And over the time several years now that you've been holding these events do you think they've got more menacing aggressive and violent yes 100 percent. really shocking i mean they're just so entitled and they're right to be because they get away with it you know we don't take amplification to our speakers corner events because you're not allowed amplification and they they turn up with Guns and loud hailers at uh, guns. They don't turn up with guns. <laughs> with drums. Jesus. Uh, so sorry. Um, with drums and loud hailers and uh, make loads and loads of noise. I think I was just sort of had the vision of America in my head then. And um, I don't think they turned up with guns either. But the police did. <laughs> Is it something you worry about, oh, though? I mean, I, 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 I. I'll be honest, I do not have the balls slash ovaries to do what you do. I would absolutely not wade into the centre of a hostile crowd. Um, do you worry about, um, particularly after New Zealand, do you worry about um, the escalation really getting out of hand? 
Yeah, well, I do have on order on its way a very thin stab and bulletproof vest. So, and I and I can't go to any of my events now without it's a, it's about twelve hundred pounds every time I go out uh, and do one of these events for my own personal security. Wow. So yeah, I take it quite seriously. Where does if you don't mind me saying, where does that funding come from? Do you have do you have women helping you to crowdfund this all of this stuff? No, I have these lovely T-shirts and merchandise that I sell, and um, I do get donations. But that is a that's a very small portion of um, the money that I raise. It's um, yeah, it's just this this merchandise, and the beautiful thing about it is that everybody gets something for the money that they give and it's it's um you get to be part of a fight you get to fund a successful campaign you get to be part of something so even if you can't speak you can wear something that that says that you object even if you're the only one that knows exactly what it means so this i'm wearing a suffragette diamante suffragette t-shirt um it might be for some women that they know what it means or a tiny little badge. They know what they're wearing. They're, they know that they're not being gaslit and that they have a voice. Um, and also, with you know, I, I get to use the profit of those sales to fund arguably like one of the most successful campaigns and visible campaigns against what is occurring in the world uh, with regards to transgenderism and the attack on women's rights. Yeah, because probably I would say across the whole of the Western world, the only point on which um, the sort of left progressive juggernaut has been turned around has been on trans and in the UK. And Mm. why do you think it is that it it has been um, British turfs in particular (laughs) who have proved to be so successful at this very, very on this very specific political question that it really has proved possible to actually turn around what the government was intending to do? I think it's in our bones and blood. Um, I think we're such an old democracy that there's there's something in it. I can't quite tell you what it is, but it feels that it's something to do with how old <laughs> we are as a, as a people. Um, I think it's because there are many strands of pushback in america the most known strands of pushback are from the right and so therefore as i'm sure you know um women on the left are pretty bad at working across the aisle um and they're very frightened of being uh, attached to right-wing cooties as they would say in the u.s i think there's something to do with the left and authoritarianism as well, so the countries where it's worse, um, have also had really uh, terrible lockdowns. Um, so I think it's I think it's some of these things we are used to questioning. We have access. We live in small geographical areas. If I want to meet with women from all over this country, for even the you know the person furthest away, it's only like an hour and a half on a plane. Uh, whereas in the US, that could just be going to the next large city uh, in your own state. So I think I think it's got to do with that. But um, we also knew about it and we don't mutilate kids. I mean, we medically can mutilate children here, but we're not slicing off um, children's body parts. And we don't have a medical community, like the large medical community, making a literal killing. Um, from the mutilation of people so maybe it's that maybe it's to do with sort of private health care um authoritarianism but yeah we've we've done really well and the most successful campaigns are apolitical they they don't attach themselves to any side of politics yeah so so you are um have you ever spoken about who 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 you'd vote for in terms of Labour or Conservative? Have you ever expressed a partisan preference, or or do you try and deliberately um, avoid doing so in order to capture that kind of apolitical spirit?
Maiden Mother Matriarch is brought to you by Keeper, the world's most advanced matchmaking solution. Now, many of you will know that I'm normally extremely suspicious of dating apps like Tinder and Bumble, which tend to produce repeat customers who must endure endless, miserable hookups and short-term relationships without ever finding a spouse. Well, Keeper is a completely different kind of service. Its algorithm prioritises immediate attraction, but also, crucially, long-term compatibility, because forever is the goal. Everyone in the Keeper matchmaking pool is there because they want to find a spouse. Using psychometric tests like Big Five, IQ and masculine and feminine polarity, Keeper can accurately predict who you're going to have the strongest chemistry with. The platform only gives you a match if you are an exact fit psychometrically and if the match offers everything that you've told Keeper you're looking for in a partner. It won't waste your time with only good enough matches like other dating apps and matchmaking services will. So, Find your keeper at keeper.ai. That's K E E P E R dot AI. Well, I'm a single issue campaigner, and, and at the moment, I'm a single issue, vo- issue voter. And so, my last general election was. Candidates that wouldn't have got in, or a Conservative, um, Michelle Donnelly, what's that name? or Helen Belcher, who is a man who calls himself a woman, who was a candidate for Liberal Democrats. Liberal Democrats are probably the worst party for being totally infiltrated and captured by this uh, lie um, of that men can be women. Um the Greens, I would never vote Green. Uh, and so it's Labour and Conservative. And at the moment, um, actually, at the moment, I don't have to vote for anyone because I'm going to be a candidate. So, <laughs> that, Yes, that was what I was going to ask about. So am I right that you're intending to stand as an independent candidate in Keir Starmer's constituency? Yeah, although we are, well, we're forming a party called the Party of Women. So we are uh, just adjusting our constitution slightly because once you register with the Electoral Commission, they have a few little things that you have to adjust. So we are just in the process of doing that. Um, and then we want women all over the UK and the world to start standing in their local elections, uh, council elections, um, general election, and women just, you know, I think I think one of the reasons this has gone so bad is because once a man who calls himself a woman is engaged in any conversation, whether it's in a council, say you have 12 people in a, in a room talking about building the next toilet block in the town centre. If you've got a man in there saying that he wants unisex because for poor, vulnerable women like himself, um, he needs to be able to use a toilet and not feel invalidated, it's going to take a very bold person to say, no, women deserve their spaces because he will have totally changed the feel and air of that room. Well, I want women in those conversations um, and men if need be, but I want women in those conversations who are bold enough to say no and mean it and fight for it. And I think that's what, that's what the party of women will be. It will be women being advocates for women. For women. Who knew? And is the party of women going to be single issue um, on the issue of gender identity or or are there other policies that you'll be including as well? Well, I think it's so wide reaching. I mean, it's, I I sort of call it a single issue, but it really does impact every single aspect of uh, our lives because we have no more women only spaces. Like just by virtue of the fact that there are men can go into any of them. We have no women-only spaces. Um, We have no right to uh, autonomy when it comes to single-sex spaces, even in our most vulnerable uh, situations. You know, I had a male midwife for my second baby. It was just horrible. Um, Just like, I, I don't want men in these spaces. I'm quite happy. I don't even understand why men choose to go into those roles, but... Um, I'm probably sounding like an 85-year-old woman, but I really don't, of all the areas of medicine, I don't know why some men are choosing to go into very female-focused areas of medicine, but that's probably another, that's for another conversation. 
Um, but yeah, it, it, it's in our education system. You know, if we can just get activism out of our education system and we focused on the things like um, respect through osmosis, through good school systems, like all of those things. I think if we start um, unbaking the cake, then it, it, there's so many areas, you know, I think it could take four years of arguing in the House of Commons about it. At least. Yeah. I mean, I, I, mean, I do genuinely think that... Um... In the UK, I think the corner has been turned and I think the gender critical side has won. Um, but there's still um, one of the things that um, uh, Helen Joyce uh, pointed out when she came on my show a little while ago was the extent to which um, there are some people who, who particularly I'd say the parents of the parents of uh, children who have gone through some kind of medical intervention and, and have transitioned with their parents' encouragement, they're going to take a lot to accept that they made a mistake because of the horror of accepting that you actually have done wrong by your, by your child for any parent is, is incredibly painful. So even if um, we've won, you've won in terms of your um, sort of winning the political argument, I, I agree, I don't think it's going to be I don't think it's going to be a quick fix by any means. I think this is going to go on a lot longer. Mm. Look how many teachers we've got that are activists. Like somebody was saying, uh, I think it was in the Isle of Wight, that where the scandal was where a teacher had to talk to children about how to masturbate, like 12 and 13 year olds, I think they were. How to masturbate. Masturbate. I'm sure I should say it with an ah. Um, and I just thought, no, you didn't have to. Like, you could have said no. Like, why? You either do something that you know to be wrong or you don't do it. But you either commit that, you either do the wrong thing or you don't. There's plenty of opportunities that you could have said no rather than go, oh, I, you know, I didn't feel comfortable. And what about those kids? Like, why were you more important in your comfort or your um, whatever it was that you were afraid of? How could that be worse than blurring the boundaries of sexual activity between children and adults. Like, I just, yeah, so all those all those things, you'll need really rigid policies put into those schools that mean serious discipline if you even broach any of this with children. You know, I went into my children's school and they said, oh, we're going to have gyres. We're going to have gyres come and talk to the children. I just went, do you know, do you know what I do? Like, do you know what I do on a daily basis? She said, yes. I said, good, because this will be easy. No, you're not. That's just did, not happening. Did they back down? And she's, she's like, yeah. Because I think when I say to someone, in the fa <laughs> looking them in the face and say, no, you're not. You know, that's a, that's a very clear statement. There is... That's a, I am not going to be persuaded. I know what I'm talking about. You will not do that. One of the features about you having such a distinctive, such a distinctive look, like the Marilyn hair, the red lipstick, everything, um, is that you can't really go incognito in the rest of your life. Like, um, I'm, I'm obviously nowhere near as, um, uh, as famously turfy as you are, but I... I just go, I go by a different name, for instance, when I'm um, not outside of professional circles and I, I keep my head down and I, I, I do things like I don't wear makeup sometimes when I'm going somewhere where I think that I might recognise because it's harder to spot someone if they're not in makeup. When you, for instance, you go into a children's school, like you, you're Posey Parker, right? People, people must, people must know what they're getting in for. Well, if they know me. Well, a lot of people don't know me at all, right? There's, I mean, maybe this is maybe this is changing, and it probably is changing quite rapidly. I do get recognised now when I go out, and often it's really lovely. I was I was in an airport in Australia, just about to get on a flight, and I don't know if this I don't know if this man knew enough about me because he was very brave, and he just looked, he just turned around. He was about six foot two, just turned around, and he went. You're that woman, aren't you? No, oh, no. It was a really like, <laughs> was like a middle-aged man. And I said, I don't know who you mean. And he said, 
you're disgusting. I just, and then carried on in the queue. He was on the same flight as me. So when we got to the carousel, I just went over loudly and I said, who on earth do you think you are? Why would you think you could say that to me? You have, you know nothing about me. You know what you've read in the media. That's it. And he said, um, I said, do you want to go in changing rooms with the little girls? Is that what you're saying? And he said, um, oh, I said, well, what is a woman? And he said, well, I expect you think, <laughs> you think a woman is whatever Rupert Murdoch says. <laughs> it's like, it's an adult human female. What are you talking about? So that's the only kind of really, that's the most, I mean, aside from people in places where I am an activist, um, that anyone's ever said anything terrible, I mean, aside from online, but to my face, I'm not very good at, I'm really not very good at backing down. So, um, you know, I'm always ready. I'm kind of ready now where I go to check in hotels. I'm like, is there going to be someone that says, actually, we don't want you to stay here or a restaurant? Sorry, we won't serve you. You know, that because that's acceptable these days. But yeah, look, if you if you know me, you know me. But if you don't know me, I'm it's not like I'm I'm well known in a small population as opposed to by everyone. What does it feel like being so, so infamous, like on an emotional level? I mean, obviously, people are responding to your public persona, which is different from from, you know, the real you. But it must there must be. Is there an emotional toll? No. I guess I'm, this is who I, I guess if I, if I wasn't this person, if I wasn't like this, I wouldn't be able to do it in the first place. And therefore it probably would be, it wasn't like suddenly overnight I started to be this person and then took some consequences. This is, this is who I am. And I've just found a vehicle which really suits who I am to get something done that needs to be done. Um, and I'm right. So I don't care who hates me. I don't care who dislikes me. I don't care what women say um, about me on this side of the debate. Um, I, those things don't change the fact that I'm right. Were you involved in political campaigning before this issue came along in any way? No. Too busy. Four children. Stayed at home. Never thought I would stay at home. I thought I'd find it boring and terrible and just not fulfilling. And I couldn't have been more wrong. And then as soon as my baby, my first baby was born and he's 21, um, I just thought, I, I don't think I, I don't want to leave him at all. Um, and then I had another baby. I was pregnant within six months. And so then I had another baby really close together. And then I... I just loved it. Yeah. Um, do you describe yourself as a feminist nowadays? No. Have you described yourself as a feminist in the past? Yes, for a brief spell. Um, uh, I was a feminist and then it became a real barrier to what I wanted to achieve ironically, to save women and their rights. And I remember in 2016, when I was still calling myself a feminist, I said to my, I was in the kitchen, I remember it very clearly, and I just said to my husband, wouldn't it be funny, but I think in order to protect women's rights, we're going to have to abandon feminism. I don't even know what he said. He probably wasn't even listening. I just, I just... You know, it's really early on in my uh, activities in this side of the debate, in this debate at all. Uh, but I think I knew a long time ago that women aren't feminists. Most women are not feminists. And they won't listen to you if you are, or if you frame your argument with respect to the patriarchy or feminism or oppression. Um, they understand sexism. Like all women understand sexism. We've all experienced sexism. Uh, but when you start talking uh, too often with using the word misogyny, I think you lose so many women. 
And also women that were feminists kept going, you're not a feminist. You're not feminist enough because you don't do this or you stayed home with your kids or you're a trad wife, whatever that means. I think it includes housework, so I don't quite fit that and I don't really cook. I don't know what I did <laughs> before activism, but um, yeah, I just thought, okay, fine. If you're going to say I'm not a feminist because then I'm just not a feminist and and it's worked really well for me. And let's face it, who are some of the worst women for pushing this hideous ideology? Well, they will also call themselves feminists. Yeah, I was going to say, so the, so the principle of the party of women is to get women into these decision-making rooms. Um, I mean, one of the issues to contend with, as I'm sure you're well aware, is that actually some of the most vociferous opponents of of you and of the party of women are also women. Like so much of what's going on here is actually a battle within, um, within womankind. They're just wrong. <laughs> so, I look, I've thought about this a lot and it's happened. My whole women have been the, the worst people I've met my whole life. Um, and that doesn't mean that women do the worst things in, in, you know, out the two sexes. I, I'm pretty sure psychological war warfare is um, pretty damaging. So, you know, it was, it was girls that were nasty at school, like relentlessly. Uh, it's often led by envy and jealousy, which apparently if you discuss, then you're a terrible woman. But it's true. Uh, there is There is something about... So well, the feminists, for example, talk about non-hierarchical, a hierarchical kind of organization. That's just a lie, as far as I'm concerned. Because in any, in any uh, feminist organization, the big fallout is like, who's top dog? So it's an, it's an absolute lie. Um, and actually, a lot of the women that talk about feminism and, oh, who does she think she is? That's because they want to be top dog. And that's because there is a hierarchy in women's groups. It's just really covert and dishonest. Whereas kind of men, you know, with their peeing contest, you know, everyone can see it. They know it. They all know that they're doing, you know, when Trump walks into a room with Putin or whatever, they, they both know they're putting their shoulders back a little bit more and doing the harder handshake. It's, it's really up front and center, but women are not. They're, they're covert. So we have to work out what these women gain by um, attacking other women by you know is it is it that a bit like the parents who can never admit they can never admit what they've done to their children i don't think they ever will actually i think that would be far too painful i think uh that would be more suicide inducing before anybody could ever admit that they've enabled the mutilation of their child um and in fact i think why some of the parents are such massive advocates for transing more kids is because they just want to cover, they want to protect their own decision. And I think that's the same with some women who hate other women. They don't want to admit, or they can disguise their position in this world if they can, they can crush other women or they can pretend that, that these men in dresses are more vulnerable. It's, I can't, I'm not a psychologist, so I can't, accurately pinpoint what it is but I can I can feel it you know young women for example um I often say they hate us but they will become us you know say to them when I'm when they're screaming at me I'm like you hate us but you will become us like like you will have wrinkles you won't be as um sexually uh alluring to men um these things will happen when when you speak and your value is somewhat diminished that will that will also happen to you. Um, and also, I'm very confident and that, that that's not a great thing to be uh, as a woman. Like other women don't like it. Uh, men who do it are really cool and, oh my gosh, he's got such bravado. Women who do it are boastful and conceited and uh, show-offs. When you were younger and before you'd had your own kids, if, if, if trans activism had come along... Do you think you might have been more persuaded by it or do you think you were always sort of um, confident enough in your own mind that you wouldn't have been taken in by it? I'm really in 
in touch with what it means to be female. Like I started my periods at 10 years old. I had to wear a bra from the age of like eight or nine. And I was skinny. It wasn't like, you know, I was chubby. And uh, so, and I was sexually harassed from the age of like nine or 10. So I've always been really clear what it means to be a woman. And I, th- I think once anybody understands that most of these men are just transvestites who just get sexually aroused, I don't think they would be convinced. But I'm also very, very happy to be the only person in a room with an opinion opposing everybody else. Like, I probably quite enjoy it. Um, I really like... You don't get that heart in your mouth feeling when you're in, in confrontation. You don't, do, you feel, do you feel like physically stressed when you're in confrontation? No. No. I rarely walk away from a situation saying, I wish I'd said X, Y, Z. Occasionally. <laughs> I do that every I time. I that. <laughs> but no, I really, I find conflict really exciting. Like not, not being in the middle of a mob conflict, but you know, if, if I was talking to you and you were pro-life or even if you were pro-choice, right? And I'm pro-choice. So I don't know what you are. But whatever side you were on, I could very, very well argue and enjoy giving you the opposing view to find out exactly what what kind of millimeter of difference there is between those two positions. Because it is. It's just one tiny little something somewhere that makes the difference between one side or the other side of any given thing. Um, and so, no, I... I really enjoy it. I'm, I think, I'm sure you probably do, which is why you do it, no? Why you have these conversations. So just going back to this term um, feminism and your reluctance to use it, I mean, I get asked this question quite often. Um, do you describe yourself as a feminist, given that I'm often very critical of a lot of um, ideas within feminism? And I say yes, because I think that there's a, Outside of the sort of activist definition of it, I think there's a broader definition, which is to do with just defending the interest, defending the interests of women and girls. And, you know, when 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 you list all of the things that you feel so passionately about, you know, defending women's spaces, um, sexual harassment, sexual violence, you know, you mentioned the fact that all women sort of will, will have experienced sexism and will know what sexism is vast majority of people would hear that and they say well that's feminism you know that's what that describes but you're you're still you you still disavow the label well because I think you know if somebody hears well that's a feminist goal then I'm happy for them to hear that and it you know probably does align with that but I just don't want what I do to have the boundaries of any ideology even if it's one that would totally encapsulate what I do um, because there are a lot of women that will just hear she's a feminist and that's it. That's no more. And some of those women may have really bizarre ideas about what feminism is. Um, You know, do I want, I want Muslim women, um, Jewish women. I want old women, young women, women on the right who are consistently told that they have less value um, and they're not welcome. You know, like loads of the leading feminists in this in the UK will, well, I don't know whether they're leading, actually. They might think they're leading. But, you know, women I'm sure you've interviewed on your podcast will talk about, um, oh, well, you know, everyone's welcome. Well, not them. You know, we don't want to hear their voices. And I sort of think uh, we recently did um, Belfast. And apparently, now, I don't know this to be true about this woman. She seemed very nice on the day. Um and let's just pretend it, it's not who they were talking about. Let's pretend somebody did turn up who was genuinely part of some sort of what is called far right. Now, what that what far right might mean these days is is up for debate because I think it's literally wanting the genocide, <laughs> the genocide of people on the basis of their race. That's what I kind of think far right white supremacy means. Um, but anyway, let's say this woman's born into a particular sort of family and they do have some pretty discriminatory, um, prejudicial views, uh, totally unfounded, 
um, pretty abhorrent. Most of us would would think they were terrible. How's that woman ever going to leave that? If that's what she's surrounded by, why wouldn't I want to welcome her into let women speak um, and give her a voice and let her feel proud and wonderful about being a, a woman and being amongst women that maybe she would not like to stand with? Like, I just, it's just so powerful to watch that. And I think that way of pulling somebody out or pulling someone in out of the cold from some views that I'm sure we would all find unpalatable is a much better way than saying, well, let's not, you know, she's not welcome. Like, and that's, for me, that's, that's what feminism does. It, it tells some women that they aren't welcome. And there's lots of polling, of course, showing that, um, as I'm sure you know, that most women don't identify as feminists and, and don't like the label. Um, do you think there's a class difference as well? Do you think that middle class women are more open to the feminist label than our working class women? Yeah, because I think it's an easy thing to say and it's a very difficult thing to do. Mm. And um, I think a lot of women who call themselves feminists, I mean, I, I don't know what it is about them that they... You know, there's, there's feminists that criticize the way I look, like publicly will say horrible things about the way I look uh, or just, they're so vicious. I mean, I would say the most, and this is a terribly gendered term and I accept it is, and I think it is for a reason. And that's, that's that the, the most bitchy women I know actually call themselves feminists and they have large platforms and they're like just relentlessly personal. What do you think is the role of men in supporting this cause? Do you are you happy to sort of include men in the fold? Yes, a hundred percent. I mean, what's missing from the opposite side are what I would call heterosexual alpha males, or probably even well, yeah, heterosexual alpha males are not fighting against women in this particular fight. Maybe they have other ways to uh, attack women. But, um, yeah, I think I think this is a fight against truth. Like, whilst I want women to have this to be the voices in this fight, I don't think they need to be the only voices, but I don't mind men speaking for themselves, but I don't want men speaking for women. I think that's been happening far too much. Um, so I don't want men speaking for women. Um, but I think that men have a, a duty if they love the society in which they live or the families or communities, whatever it is, um, to uphold truth, I think is, is a fight for all of us. Will, uh, the party of women include men in its membership or is it going to be strictly single sex? No, we, I think we have to, but by law, we probably have to include men in our membership and I'm, I'm happy to, you know, so my whole thing started with the word woman when I put the billboard up and I, it was one of those things where I was just like, what is it? What is it? What is right at the center of this? And I was like, ah, it's the, it's this word. They want our, they take this word and we're game over. Like if they can have this word, then how on earth are we going to be able to talk about us at all? Um, and so that's why it's the party of women, because it's our very existence that is under threat. Um, but yeah, of course I want, I want men. They can, I, look, they can stand as candidates if they want. Um, and certainly p party memberships. I mean, they've got deep pockets, right? Um, More pockets than we have. <laughs> that's certainly true. Um and in terms of the, the sort of the longer term hopes for the Party of Women and for all of your work, I mean, so obviously you started off campaigning in the UK and have made a lot of progress there and um, now attempting to sort of ignite the same um, political movements in, in America and Australia and elsewhere. Do you think there will be a point at which um, you've won? And we sort of roll back to whatever a couple of decades ago, the status quo legally and, and, and politically, and it will be over? Or do you think that there's a much more fundamental uh, 
a much more fundamental issue at the heart of this particular question. Do you, like, in, in other words, do you think that the whole trans thing is actually the tip of an iceberg and there's a bigger sort of war on reality which you're engaged with? I do think that. Um, I was having a conversation with someone yesterday and I think the difference between... So there's lots of, there's lots of people that are against this whole woke, untruth kind of unreality in which we are seemingly being pushed towards there is you know it feels it feels bigger it feels like there's something really dangerous going on I think if I was a religious person I would probably I think it was slightly apocalyptic it was you know it's 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 a bit weird and it's it's very unsettling and there there is a almost tangible kind of taste of violence I think uh, everywhere like it's like something from a terrifying movie when you know just before a storm comes and you sort of the air slightly changes it kind of feels like the world's air has slightly altered somewhat so I think there is a bigger picture but also I think once we motivate women so with my uh, so with the party of women we're also going to do <laughs> turf aware which is like a tupperware turfy women in their own homes yes. um Parties, which uh, I've just found out that's what the suffragettes did with tea parties. And actually, they weren't really having tea parties. They were talking about political activism. So it's sort of, it's another, you know, a lot of women, when they first have babies, they feel very isolated. And when their kids first go to school, and it's a really, it can be a really isolating time. But if you could have something, you know, these home parties where you actually make a bit of money, talk about politics, have a women only kind of, um party um whatever i think that's great so anyway so once we've built this amazing constituency of women and it won't just be the uk we want party of women, a bit like the green party we want party of women in loads of different countries then i think it would be foolish not to capitalize on such a bold collective of women and then I think we can look at other things. I mean, a, a lot of things that people talk about, I don't think are that big and important uh, when it comes to, you know, like, yes, it's important that women have access to sanitary products, but I find it really odd that that's the, that's the thing about women's rights that makes it through parliament, not kind of getting rid of grooming gangs and finding out why the hell so many women, so many young girls were at risk um, from this pretty vile, systematic raping and torturing of these girls. Like, you would think that <laughs> that would get through our parliament in a kind of, oh, my God, it's like the end of the world stuff. It's 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 a, an indictment of a really vile, women-hating society that can allow this to, to continue with so many people knowing about it. You would hope that that would that would be more important. So I certainly would look at stuff like that. There's, there's human trafficking. Um, surrogacy is another issue that I, um, I know you had, you spoke to Jennifer Lal, who I adore um, and consider, consider her a friend um, and surrogacy, surrogacy and this um, other divorcing of humanity from humans. So I would say surrogacy was definitely up there. The transitioning is up there. Uh, we know that there's, organ harvesting uh all over the world uh, particularly in war zones it's a very it's a very lucrative thing byproduct of of war is uh human organ harvesting so uh anyway yes so once we have this constituency of women i don't see why we wouldn't take their power and and use it for other good i don't know if you read um a piece by mary harrington who's also been he's a friend of mine who's also been on this show um, that was came out a few months ago, I think, um, in which she compared you uh, as a compliment to Nigel Farage in the sense of being um, a really successful politician who is who's sort of single issue, but also manages to tap into a mood and to 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 really, really piss off a lot of people in elite positions, but also really galvanizing a movement. I don't how do you how do you respond to the comparison? You have better hair than him, I should obviously say. <laughs> well, thanks. Um, and better jackets as well. Um, 
I think it's a compliment. I mean, like I a really long time ago, this is this is no word of a lie. I was like, we need to be like UKIP. You know, we and people are like, oh, we don't want to be like that. And I said, he had a single issue. He took he took this country out of the European Union, like from nowhere. You know, one minute it was like laughing and mocking this man and how ridiculous it was, and the next minute we we voted to leave. we voted to leave. Why would we not want to be like him? And he, I think he his um, Teflon was that. He laughed off quite a lot of the criticism. He didn't wear he didn't wear it too much. He didn't respond like when people were really angry at him. He he didn't respond with anger, um, and he just stuck to his fundamental message, which which eventually just penetrated the population of the UK. Um, and people people who were motivated to leave in the working classes, you know, the left loves the working class, but not the racist or the stupid or the ignorant. Um, or the xenophobic ones um, who voted to leave, but they love all the working class. Um, I think that was a really change. That was a changing moment in in this country to go from, you know, hate a Tory is one thing, but to call a whole bunch of working class people ignorant, racist, and stupid on the basis that they thought about sovereignty and sovereignty was somehow like a sovereignty was spoken about like a sovereign ring. You know, it was like, it was like a, it was just a um, uh, class. It was such a classist sort of thing. Oh, they care about sovereignty, as if that doesn't, as if that doesn't matter. It's just, just nuts. So anyway, yes, I was, I was, um, I think it was a, a nice compliment. And do you think in some senses, actually, some of the clashes over Brexit, which obviously weren't really just to do with like our membership of the European Union, but were, were, were sort of deeper cultural clashes, actually, do you think that they map on to this clash? Do you think in some sense it's actually the same? It's just this, the same battle, but over a slightly different issue? Gosh, I don't know. Is the answer. I think it is a middle class it's more middle class people but they're just more online because i think that's how this has happened so the the trans activists these sort of things um the academic kind of uptake of it yeah potentially it is but it's more of a lie um and i think the people know they're lying so i think when keir starmer says things like 99.9 .9 or whatever I, th I think he knows he's lying, whereas probably the elitist kind of vile way that people spoke, I don't think they knew that they were victims of this sort of propaganda. I don't think they know. They knew that they were lying, if that makes sense. I think they were genuine, <laughs> genuine in their belief that they thought people who voted for Brexit were thick, ignorant and racist. I think people are genuine in their belief that, um, I don't know, I mean, I find it hard to imagine anyone saying that they, you know, they absolutely believe that men and women don't exist as biological categories and so on. But I think people are sincere when they th they think that um, what you're saying sort of comes part and parcel with with the far right, with these guys making Nazi salutes um, at your protest. You know, I think that they they've bundled all of this together in a way that they consider to be really sinister. And I think that they are um, sincere in that view. I mean, what would you say to someone who who maybe comes from a left progressive background and maybe has some misgivings about some of the extremes of trans activism, but also finds, um, you know, for instance, just, just, just saying these people are men, you know, trans women are men, finds that alarming, finds the whole thing a little bit frightening. Is there anything that you would say to them to sort of um, persuade them over to your to your way of viewing things? Well, I guess you'd have a long conversation about how important it is to be truthful and what damage it can do when you're not truthful. And I look, I have to hold the line. So I accept that I'm one of the few that I really don't catch my language. I, I, um, 
you know, you used male people. I've that sense of, um, that's like nails on a chalkboard. I find it really difficult to call men male people and try and try and balance the an argument away from you know recognizing men as men because then we recognize what violent threats they might they might come with men not all men uh but we know that uh you know you can start masking stuff when you don't use really accurate language so i don't know if it's my job to persuade people that i'm actually a really decent lovely warm cuddly fuzzy human because that's not my role my role is to keep pulling back and keeping the damn overton window um over truth that's that's my that's my job my job is to prov- provoke conversations so that people can really understand what the issue is um and i'm sure there's other people that can say to those people who are, who are afraid of me saying that's a man um there are other people that they might be persuaded by but i stuck to this for 5 years i've stuck to this uh language in fact i've probably sharpened my language but i've really stuck to this and more and more people and like i used to think she was quite harsh but she was right all along so i'm i'm happy that that person who was afraid of direct language will catch up oh, great notes went on um uh so in the extended bit in just a moment i want to talk more about um what how you first woke up to this issue and went from being um you know alleged trad wife to alleged Nigel Farage um, <laughs> um but for everyone else who's watching the uh the the main part of the show uh where can they find more of you where can they buy your t-shirts where can they how can they support what you're doing okay so if you want to the activist part is standingforwomen.com i'm on twitter at the posy parker uh and if you want to buy some of the incredible merchandise it's adulthumanfemale.store Kelly, thank you so much. Thank you so much for watching that episode of Maiden Mother Matriarch and for all of your support. It means an enormous amount for the growth of the show. If you want to hear bonus content, an extra 20, 30 minutes of conversation with the guest, maybe a little bit more personal, a little bit less filtered, then you can go to my Substack at louiseperry.substack.com where you can sign up for extended episodes and also bonus episodes and you can also access our chat community you can also support the show by subscribing on youtube or subscribing wherever you get your podcasts and rating and reviewing on apple podcasts is also really great for encouraging other people to give the show a try please also spread the word tell people that you know who you think might like it to give it give it a shot um the word of mouth effect is really valuable. So we'd really appreciate it. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening, watching and supporting what we're doing.